So, anyway, good deal. All right, so let's get started, man. We're going to get started on the word. I think that that's it. I don't think I have anything else. All right, listen, I'm not going to read this whole chapter tonight. I don't even know that I'm going to keep you here till eight. I might, I might not. We'll just see what the Lord says. I'm not going to read this whole chapter. I want to focus on the first five verses. We're going to be on this particular chapter and these concepts for these two different services, okay? Because I'm, and that's why I wrote the addendum, because I believe it's important enough that I want you to be able to understand it. When it's all said and done, you might not even agree with me. And guess what? I'm okay with that. I just want you to try to be able to understand what I'm seeing here. And this has been literally years and countless hours of studying and trying to understand what I believe to be the riddle. Can I call it a riddle? I'm going to call it a riddle. The riddle, yeah, that's an even much better word. I did put riddle in the paper, but also use mystery on this time. It, so that's a better word because it's a word that's in the mystery. All right? Okay, but a riddle, technically, it's a mystery. Thank you. All right? All right? Jane said it. A riddle is a mystery. All right, here we go. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. I will show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations. Of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, this word admiration always stumped me, you know, and so, listen, because if you look at it, it's like, oh, so you admire this harlot riding the beast, which is obviously some kind of a connection to Satan and his plans. Um, but the idea is, is that he, if you look at this particular word, it's built off of, it's a, it describes to look closely at, to perceive it, to compare, right? To behold, to view attentively, to contemplate. So he saw this thing in this vision, and he, and I, could, I would say that, I, I don't think it would be an improper word to say that he was so taken by it. That he was mesmerized in some sense, and it caught him to go into deep thought about it. I think that now when I say mesmerized, I don't mean hypnotized. I'm saying sometimes you see something and it gets your attention, and you're like, wow. And you may even think about it for the next couple of weeks. Like I told you all the story about the two dudes that were setting up this camera, and the guy, the conversation, I thought, thought, I thought about those guys for two weeks. And the conversation that took place because of the things that were said, you get the point that I'm trying to make. Right? All right, let's go backwards because I want to try. That's all we're going to read tonight. And I want to I point out a couple of main concepts that I want to talk to you about. Okay? So one of the first ones is I want to talk about the whore. Right? Now let's, let's take a look at another translation because maybe the word whore might offend you. I don't know. I'm just saying. I didn't write it. The translators of the King James wrote it. I remember one time I tried to get that dude at Bethel over there across the railroad tracks to let me go and preach. He said, I'm going to need to hear one of your messages. I said, got it on Johnny on the spot, boss. It's coming right at you. CD that said, there's a whore in the house. <laughs> he never called me back. Oh, you're trying to teach him something that the Lord had shown him. He didn't like the party. Right. I don't know. Yeah, the Lord changed, changed his preaching. Right. The great prostitute. That's, how, that's what the ESV calls it, the great prostitute, right? Let's take a look at what, I know that NIV, I know y'all don't like that translation, it says the great prostitute too, so let's see what the NASB, the great harlot. I kind of like that harlot um, kind of idea, but nevertheless, it's whatever you want to look at it, the idea is the same. Whether it, it, and essentially the meaning of the word is, 
is a woman. You, you know what the meaning of the word is. It's illicit, illicit sexual encounters that are not within the will of God, whether they be for money or not. Now, one of the things, so, so look, that's one of the things we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about the, her, the harlot, right? We're going to talk about the kings of the earth that committed fornication with her, right? And we're going to talk about the inhabitants of the earth that have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. It doesn't say inhabitants of the earth during the time frame of Babylon or Persia or Greece or Assyria which preceded Babylon, Persia and Greece. It didn't say just the inhabitants of the earth during the Roman Empire. It didn't say just the inhabitants of the earth in America. It said the inhabitants of the earth. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. See, to me, you, if you believe in the Bible, if you believe in the Lord, and you live on the earth, you should want to know what that means because you want to make sure you're not drunk with the fornication of the wine, right? I would think, anyway. Right? So we're also going to talk about the beast. We're going to try to break that down. The beast has seven heads and ten horns. We're going to kind of talk about that quite a bit, actually. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. I think that's an interesting thing, is the, is the apparel that she wears. I mean, again, this is a vision. You get it, right? He saw something in a vision. He, it didn't mean that there was a literal seven-headed monster galloping in a, on a literal road with a, a harlot, you know, flinched back and a golden cup in her hand. No, this is, but this is what he saw, and it's a very vivid vision. But this is all symbolic of something else. Right? And the Bible did never never tells us in one spot, at least that, not that I have found, exactly what this is. And anybody in this room that has really studied the book of Revelation or end time events in the book of Daniel that is interconnected where we get some pieces of information like a sleuth looking and investigating and looking for the answer. Anybody in this room that has ever done that knows as well as I do. That you never have found, there's bits and pieces of information and concepts that have to be put together to come to the right conclusion. I'm, and listen, I'm not trying to get you to, to I don't want to hear nobody's praise. I want the Lord to say, well done, my good and first faithful servant when I see him. But I'm talking about countless hours of study. Yes, reading the works of other men, more than just a particular man, but many people don't agree with that, don't agree with that. Oh, that looks good. Don't agree with that. Don't agree with that. Oop, that looks good. Let me study it. Let me break down the words. Let me understand concepts. Let me go through a whole period in my life where I learned about the Illuminati. Boy, that was a weird time. Started with Sean giving me hip hop five. Okay, that. How many years ago was that? Ten. When he gave me that bootleg copy of hip hop five. Okay, ten years ago, and that was just an open door. I'm like, oh my god, I gotta write a book now. Okay. So I'm just telling you, I've been down the road. It don't mean I know what I'm talking about. It just means I've tried to learn. That's all I'm talking about. All right. So she dressed in purple and scarlet, which is pretty interesting. She's also decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand. On her head was written, Mystery Babylon the Great. The, and look at this. This is another description of her. She's not just a harlot, my friend. She's a mother of them. And now, you know, I've got all fancy in my thinking way back, probably, I don't know, seven years ago when I taught about my book at Crossing Place. I even remember saying, she's a madam. I don't even, that, I don't know that that's right. Because, see, the word mother doesn't mean madam. It's not like she's running a harlot house. She is a mother. She's giving birth, right? She, but, but, I mean, the analogy is she's giving birth. She's pumping out harlots. Boom, 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 boom. She's giving birth to them. All right, now we'll get to that in a second. And abominations of the earth. And look, also, she was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs. Of, and, and the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. All right, so let's just back up a little bit. Let's start with one word and let's go ahead and try to kind of break some of this down. And then I do have a couple of little keynote slides to, that I built to try to kind of give you a visual of what I'm trying to say. So let's talk a little bit about the harlot, all right? So what we do know about her is that she's not just a harlot, but she's also a mother of harlots. But let's take the concept of harlot first. I've tried to teach this before in the past, but what I did was I brought you to Proverbs chapter 7. You remember when we, you might not remember this, but way before we started the book of Revelation, I was talking to you about spiritual 
the spiritual warfare and about the spirit. Because listen, when you're seeing this vision of this, and when you begin to hear me try to break down for you and give you the answer to the, what my understanding of the answer to the mystery of the riddle is, you can't, with your physical eyes, say, there ain't no way. See, I sat down one time at a restaurant with a gentleman, me and Robert were there, and when I began to try to explain to him the things that I was seeing, he was like, dude, are you even serious? And he began to scoff, and he was laughing at me. But see, this particular person, that you know, and, and I love him very much, at that point in time, he, there, he could not see any of what I was trying to say, because at that point in time, he was looking with logical, intelligent eyes. And the, that doesn't work here, my friend. The letter to the Corinthian church by the Apostle Paul said, yeah, I'm not telling you to leave your intelligence at the house. No, not me. I want you to bring it with you everywhere you go. But what I'm trying to say is, is that the letter to the Corinthian church said that the natural man cannot perceive the things of God because they are spiritually discerned or spiritually revealed or spiritually understood. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, you can't see what I'm going to try to to a picture that I'm going to try to prepare for you tonight, okay, is what I'm trying to say, all right? So this, this harlot, it sits upon many waters. Now, you got to understand something that, listen, when, it's, when, we say, when we say many waters, we're talking about multitudes of people, okay? How do you know that? Because land masses jut out of water. Land masses, continents jut out of water, and on land masses live people. She comes out of, and then we're later told that she gets the whole inhabitants, that the, earth, that the inhabitants of the earth are drunk with the wine of her fornication. So what I wanted to tell you again and remind you of is that when we did study Proverbs chapter 7, even though you may not exactly remember, I got to tell you that in Proverbs chapter 7, Solomon speaks of a harlot. She's dressed in the attire of a harlot, but the whole chapter is shrouded after you read it once or twice, if you got a spiritual mind, you're going to begin to realize this, this girl ain't really just trying to pick this man up for a night of love. This girl right here is trying to put a dart in his liver. That's actually what it says, like a liver shot. You ever heard of, the, you ever heard of a liver shot? It, you get right up under that rib on the right side right there, and when they hit it, they, they just drop. I don't care how tough they are. They drop straight to the canvas, and then they're done for the rest of the night. And that's what it says at the end of the proverb. A dart strikes his liver. He wasn't even ready for it. But the whole premise, there's a bunch of religious talk up in the proverb. She says, I have paid my vows. I have given my offerings. See what I'm saying? That's talking about Jewish religion. She's done all her religious works. The good man has gone on a long journey. Jesus is far, far away. My friend, you don't even have to think. And so let us come and take our fill of love through the night. All right, so the idea there, though, is that this woman is really trying to get him to cheat on God more so. Listen, I'm not trying to excuse any, any of the others, though. I'm just trying to make a point. There is a spiritual seductress. And I call her... The spirit of the harlot that rides on the back of this beast, I call her, y'all heard me say it before, she's the spirit of Jezebel. She's the, but listen, she ain't just, and this is another thing, I hope you're okay with this, you need to be. Uh, she's not just that, but she's the spirit of, she's the spirit of battle. She's the spirit, she's, she's the antichrist spirit, okay? She's not just a she, she's also a him. Okay, and I've seen this before, but then I don't shrink back. I said it the last week or maybe the week before about Baffle Net. If you don't know what Baffle Net is, you just need to Google that and research it. I don't have time, but it's spelled B-A-P-H-O-M-E-T. It comes originally from the time frame of the Knights Templar when it was called Mohammed. It was a goat head that the Knights Templars were accused of worshiping. It later became known as Baffle Net. It's a goat head. It's a satanic sign. A, a painter, I can't remember the exact year, but it was in the 1800s, if I'm not mistaken, painted a picture. And Baphomet has a goaded beard. It looks like a man on the face, but he's got boobs. I mean, I didn't mean to say that inappropriately. He's got breasts. He's got breasts. So he goes both ways because the people in the occult call him Lucifer and they call him Lucifer. I'm just trying to give you a picture of the, of the enemy that you're up against and how really straight up weird he is and perverted. And that don't ever wonder why people can go to the lengths that they go and the depths that they go. Because if it weren't for the grace of God, my friend, you wouldn't know how far you go. Amen. 
That's right. And that's just true. Amen. Well, I don't have a proclivity toward thank the Lord. <laughs> but if you let lust run free, my friend, Amen. it can get real ugly real quick. All right. So she's a whore. And I'm trying to give you this idea that this is a spiritual thing that has actually been going on through the annals of human history. This isn't something that just shows up at the end time. Does that make sense? That was a big revelation for me because, like, I was like, oh, my, when the Lord started to open my eyes, I was like, oh, my God, like, this thing has been here the whole time. This plan has been moving and operating the whole time. I just, when I would read the book of Revelation, God, it just shows up at the end. No, the Lord spoken specifically to my spirit, this stuff has been around. You just hadn't been able to see it because it's a mystery. And you've been kind of drunk, my son. Not just drunk. You put the alcohol down a while back, but you've been drunk spiritually. You haven't been sober. You've been drunk with the fornication of her wine. Because you see, the fornication of her wine is not just some liquor, some fermented spirits. No. The fornication of her wine is every false Thing that would bring someone away from God. You know, you don't have to like it, you don't have to love it, but you gotta at least listen for the next 25, 30 minutes. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is that this fornication of this wine is some juice that has been made that is all over the place. You find it in fake news on TV, you find it in library books, you find it on the internet, you find it in the music industry, you find it in Hollywood, you find it standing behind. Christian pulpits, you find it on Christian television, you find it in India where they worship multiplicity of gods, you find it in China where they worship the Buddha, you find it in Islam where they worship Muhammad or go through Muhammad to get to Allah, which is really just a refabrication of the moon god deity. You find it everywhere that you go. The mother of harlots is giving birth to anything that will cause harlotry against God. It's interesting that she's dressed in scarlet and purple. Right, right. Okay, because we've already shown the pictures. We don't have to go through it tonight. But the pictures do not lie, my friend. If you Google right now, we're not going to do it. The, the Vatican priests and the ba Vatican cardinals, what are we going to have? Scarlet and purple. Yeah. Now, interesting enough, if we, as we continue to study... What we're going to see as we continue to study is it's going to say the seven heads are seven kings, but there are also seven hills upon which the woman sits. Amen. Now, crazy enough, you might not have studied your geography or paid attention to history, but I kind of went backwards for you to let you know that Rome is built on seven hills. Correct. Now, does that mean that that's exactly what this is? Uh, I don't really believe it is, but at the same time, we need to kind of think about this for a second because... When was this written? He, John was exiled on the Isle of Patmos during the reign of Emperor Domitian. And so it was under the emperor of Rome. And so it was Roman rule and Roman law, meaning that the whole time of New Testament Christianity was took place in the midst of the Roman Empire. So whenever we see also that this Babylon is known also as a great city and that the woman is interconnected to the city and we see all of this confusion and delusion and drunkenness, spiritually speaking, taking place, then we need to understand that it's really probably not just a geographical city. I don't believe it's just a geographical city. I, first of all, I don't believe that it's literal Babylon. Many There's been many of people that I respected that believed that, I don't believe that. Saddam Hussein tried to build, rebuild Babylon, he got as far as the gate of Ishtar, done. I don't believe that we need a, spirit, a physical Babylon because it's not really even talking about that, and I hope that you understand what I'm trying to say when it's all said and done. So, whenever, so she, she getting everybody drunk with her babies that she's producing, whether, whatever they are, and I may tell you, <laughs> that Catholicism is one of the big ones. I know that that hurts. I know that hurts. I know many, some of you, if you do watch, I said many, you probably won't have this, but I'm not going to talk about it. Whoever's watching, whoever listens, can hurt you. They do. I was born and raised a Catholic, so was I. That's why I can talk about it. I don't believe in AA either. I believe it's a bunch of garbage that was written through automatic writing. Well, how can you say that? Because I was part of it. 
So I can talk about whatever I want. And Daddy said, you can't talk about a boy unless you're Disney. That's not completely true, but I will say, I've been there, Boston. I've been there. I was born and raised Catholic, and I know, and, 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 and neither one of them right. But anyway, let's not pick on the age and I will focus on the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is built on seven hills, and also the, 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 the Vatican priests wear purple, the Vatican cardinals wear scarlet. She holds a golden cup in her hand. Okay. She holds a golden cup in her hand, and in addition to that, she's adorned with precious jewels and pearls and, and stone. What does that talk about? It talks about money. Now, is there any entity that you know of on the earth like that that has all those things? Okay, but you know, this, this is where I, I don't know if it's a curse or if it's a fright. This is what happens to my brain. Because you see, as I learn and I try to draw these chronological dates on the board for y'all and think about history and geography and all this stuff, things started popping in my brain. Because then I start thinking, oh, wait, hold on a second. The book of Revelation was written in 1895. And what I learned about the Catholic Church was that it was something completely different than apostolic Christianity. I learned that from a secular teacher that taught at Tulane University, which I'm not well, anyway. <coughs> Catholic Church didn't start until 380. Under Emperor Constantine. So now we have a very interesting concept. Well, and then if you go backwards and you start studying the religions of Babylon, mystery Babylon. Jordan, you might have to turn your phone on, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Listen, so whenever whenever you have mystery Babylon, if you go back and you start looking at at, at Muslim people praying, you'll see something. They rock back and forth. I'm, you can figure out what that is. And they're counting these bees that look eerily like a rosary. They're counting these bees, but you know why? They, you think they're Catholic? Yes, there is a weird connection. I'm really going off tonight. There is a weird connection between Fatima, Fatima, Our Lady of Fatima. They got a little Catholic school in Louisiana, Lafayette named Our Lady of Fatima. Our Lady of Fatima and Cathedral Carmel mixed together and made St. Thomas More. I know because I went to Cathedral Carmel. Fatima... Is Our Lady of Fatima? Fatima is the name of Muhammad's daughter or wife. One of those things. I'm not gonna mess up. So that's a weird little connection between. But what I'm trying to say is, prayer beads been along way before the Catholic Church, way before Islam, because see, Islam didn't even take place till 600 AD. Okay, and prayer beads been around way before that with Babylonian mystery religion. So you just do what you want with that. Now you got some low. You got, you got a little ammunition next time you talk to a cow. You just got to be careful how you choose this to present this stuff because sometimes if you vomit it all out on people, they're not ready. But then sometimes that works. So you can be ready by the spirit. Amen? All right. So, so, this is, so this Catholic church thing is just a very big time conundrum. So what I will tell you is this. I'll put it in a little paper. If you didn't get a copy, I'll get you a copy. That one of the things that you can do, though, as part of this city that I'm talking about, this Babylon, the great, this mystery city that's going to really, and when we get to Revelation 18, it becomes real clear that it's referred to as a city, and it's interconnected to the financial markets. It's interconnected to finance. Okay, I say financial markets. I mean, they didn't have a stock market back then, the commerce, okay? One of the things that I want to mention to you, this is a big concept that I was writing that thing today, that for you and I, a city kind of tends to have the connection, we only think of it in a geograph geographical concept, right? You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, in other words, the city of Patterson is situated at north latitude, blah, 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 whatever it is. And it is a community that lies within a larger geographical place known as the state of Louisiana, which lies within a larger geographical place known as the United States of America. But ge even geographical cities weren't the way that we see them today. If you look at the Syrian and Babylonian Empire and all these great uh, empires that took place biblically, they used to be called, those whole empires were known as city-states. So the biblical context of the word city is not just that it has to be Vatican City. Now, I'm going to tell you that I believe Vatican City is part of Mystery City. As a matter of fact, it's a big part of Mystery City. As a matter of fact, it might even be the, one of the biggest parts of Mystery Vatican City, Babylonian Mystery Religion, whatever, whatever. 
Okay, it's a big part of it. But it's all a part of a plan. And see, when I was like, yeah, I know conspiracy. You better believe it, but it's not a theory, my friend. You're going to have to study it for yourself to see if you believe it. But listen, behind this plan, what I need you to see is, I need you to be able to see the spirit realm. That's why that book, Supernatural or Unseen Realm, can help us. Okay, supernatural, I need you to be able to see that behind the scenes, yes, God is the ultimate puppet master, and Satan cannot do, we learn that from the book of Job, anything that God does not allow him to do, but at the same time, there's a clawed hand that works and moves pieces on a chest, uh, chest board, chessboard, moves pieces on a chessboard, and moves them in the places, and has been doing this for a really, really, really long time. I know I mentioned it before, but it gives me a great picture of what I'm trying to describe to you. When the Rolling Stones wrote the song, Ode to Satan, Ode to the Devil, however it went, and he throws Mick Jagger, throws that lyric up in there, I was there and I made Pontius Pilate wash his hands. He's trying to make a point to you. This lion devil, this serpent, this fallen angel named Lucifer, the, what the occult uh, people call the bearer of light, has been there for a really, really long time. He was already in a fallen state before man was ever formed from the clay of the dirt or of the earth, and God breathed his, his life into him. He was sitting there watching all of this take place, and he, he deceived Eve. He got... Adam to rebel, and now all of the offspring that comes forth from Adam's loins finds itself in this fallen position with this gene I'm, I'm using some scientific stuff, it's not really like that, but genetically altered DNA. It's got sin. Well, some people actually say you can see a, a serpent on some kind of squiggly, something, something like that, but at the same time, they say you can see the cross in it. Hallelujah! Amen. Blame it. That's what it was called. Yeah. All right. So this, so what are what you, what you giving a lot of information? I'm trying to make a point that behind the scenes there's a spiritual entity that is a that can. Is, I'm not trying to give him more credit than this dude. I'm just trying to, and I'm not even trying to give him credit. <laughs> I want you to choose my words wisely. I'm just trying to say, dude, this guy ain't playing. He's a whole lot smarter than any of you. He's a whole lot smarter than me. He's a whole lot more powerful than any of us in this room. But he's no match for the God that we serve. That's right. Amen? Amen? He's no match for the God we serve. Oh, he's killed many a good Christian. He's killed many a powerful man of God or under the auspices of his city-state, mystery Babylon, confusion. She gets drunk off the blood of the martyrs. She loves to see the blood of martyrs spill. She gets high on that stuff, man. Like, with glee, the whole kingdom of darkness probably shouts. But I gotta tell you, don't think them angels ain't singing when somebody takes a stand to die for the name of Jesus. Amen. So there she is, and she sits upon many waters because her influence is over all these people groups. And look at this, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. So I just want to, I just want to quick, quickly, I got some of this on the slides, I don't want to be late to the point because I told you I wasn't going to keep you too long. But look, I got even this on one of the slides. You, remember, you ever watched, uh, I think it was a Richard Gere movie. It was about King Arthur. Y'all ever watched that movie? Excalibur. <coughs> Excalibur was in the stone. The right one could wield the sword. Right? So in this story, what do we have? We got King Arthur and we got Merlin the Magician. Right? It's an illustration. It's not only using this for illustrative purposes. The magic wizard and the king. Listen, you can watch some other movies. I can't remember what the names of them are, but dude did a shield an even bit better picture of it where there was this wicked witch living in the castle and she like basically had the king under a spell. Probably Robin Hood, maybe with that weird Sherwood Forest Sheriff of Nottingham, am I right? Okay, my point is, is this, is that what this is telling us, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. They've been the leaders of the earth. Listen, when I used to see kings, I'm thinking back to King Arthur days. But no, kings are leaders of nations. What I'm trying to tell you is this, is that do you think, okay, let's just pretend for a second that this is real. All right, because I may not have convinced you of that. Let's just pretend for a second this is real. Do you think it stopped? Like, in other words, oh, yeah, but this is King James. 
version. So this was written in 1611 during the time whenever England had kings. So they, they translated it as, as kings. So let me ask you a question. Do you think that the same that, that the devil is still alive or is he dead? And if he's still alive, would he still be doing the same thing? He would be, still be doing the same thing because he's all about one plan. His plan is to create his own world order. A place where he himself can be worshipped. A place where he can be magnified. A place where he can steal your heart, my heart, and other people's hearts away from the Lord and draw it towards himself. Because he demands to be magnified. And in the end of this chapter, the beast is actually going to kill this harlot. Because guess what? The devil ain't happy with people worshipping him by proxy of Buddha or Allah or Krishna or any of this stuff. The devil ain't gonna be happy till he sits in the temple on his own Amen. throne and demands to be worshipped. Right. And demands, oh no, you're gonna live in my city state, buddy. And you're gonna live according to my rules and according to my see, that's another thing about a city. In a city, commerce takes place. Hence the term by local, right? In a city, commerce takes place. And within this city state mystery religion known as Babylon, the great city, that the enemy has been creating and knitting together since Babel. I'll put it in a, I'll put it in a little paper for you. Since that ba mystery Babylon has to cause our mind to be evoked back to the Tower of Babel. It has to. When you hear the words mystery Babylon, because out of that, if you read extra biblical material, you learn that Nimrod was the creator of ast astrology. I hope you don't read your horoscope, do you really? Please stop <laughs> And yeah, if you come to a church where we're going to tell you, quit, please quit reading your horoscope. Okay? That's right. Because it's demonic. It was created, it was called part of Babylonian mystery religion. But they did it right sometimes. Yeah, so did Sister Chloe, so did Big Mike uh, Beard in last year when he used to read my tarot cards and we were doing acid. Was I supposed to do that? No, you're not supposed to get your tarot cards read and hang out with people like that, man. I'm like, dude, tell me what's going to happen between me and my girlfriend. And she's, oh, the card of death. <laughs> you must go <laughs> I'm pretty sure I already knew that before you told me. Like, I, really, truly, why didn't you just listen to the Lord when everything was going south and you know, man, whatever. No. Death. Get away from her, young man. You know, you know, I didn't listen to that. I mean, Lord, help me listen to the Lord. Yeah. All right. So. Committing fornication with the inhabitants of the earth. All right. So these kings, again, the leaders through the ages have been in bed with her. They, she, she, what is she? She's false religion. She's false. She's sorcery. She's black magic, but not like my little friend Tim Bob that was burning some kind of incense in the room. We're talking some major stuff, dude. We're talking <coughs> worldwide sorcery. We're talking about the fact that the whole inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk to some extent with the fornication, oh, with her, the, for the line of her fornication. That means you've been affected by it, my friend. Just in some way. I'm not trying to tell you that you're under a spell and that you're some zombie. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you that in some way, shape, or form, when your eyes are blinded to the truth of the gospel, or whenever you was all up out there and you didn't even believe God was real, you was under her spell. Praise God, we're starting to come out of it. Amen. And he'll keep on bringing us out of it. He will if we'll trust him. Don't go anywhere that's going to bring you further away from the Lord. My friend, go somewhere that's going to bring you closer to the Lord. Because listen, some people are like, well, I don't even believe what, you, what you're saying. Okay, well, you better hope I'm home. That's all I'm trying to say. So they've been drunk. Carried me away in the spirit. And I saw her sitting on this beast. So this beast, look, he has seven heads and he has ten more. It's going to tell us later when we get into it that the seven heads represent seven kingdoms. But they also represent seven hills upon which the woman sits. All right. And ten horns. Now, when we get later on into Revelation 17, we're not going there tonight. I just want to kind of mention something to you. That is going to say this. It's going to say that... Five have fallen, one is. The, the, I, I may be getting it wrong a little bit. The seventh will come, and the eighth comes from the seventh. Now, if that ain't a riddle or a mystery, I don't know what it is. 
I have fallen, one now is, the seventh will come, and the eighth comes from the seventh. All right? So I'm going to try to break that down for you, but let me tell you what I believe. I believe that it's the seven heads or seven nations, and they are a conglomeration of kingdoms that have been against God from the Old Testament until the very end. Okay, the eighth is the kingdom of Antichrist that comes from the seventh. The seventh is the ten horned kingdom, which is a revitalized Roman Empire, okay, which was number six. The Roman Empire was number six. How do you know that? Because we got at least numbers three, four, five, and six from Daniel's prophecy. And the first two, number one and two, I believe, was Egypt and Assyria. Well, where are you coming from with all this? You're just making stuff up. You're pulling it out your pocket. No, I'm talking about kingdoms, biblical kingdoms that are in the Bible, because that's what we're talking about tonight, right? We're talking about the Bible. We're talking about the devil's plan to try to mess up God's plan. So we're not worried about, we're not worried about Africa. I mean, no, Africa's mentioned in the Bible. Simon of Cyrene helped Jesus carry his cross. The Ethiopians mentioned in the Bible. The Ethiopian eunuch got baptized. Hallelujah. He was working for Candace, and he said, can you help me understand this Isaiah passage? And what was it? Philip said, let me, t- let me take you. Let me take you to the, from the old all the way through to the new. And he very presented to him Jesus. And he said, what prevents me from being baptized? And he was like, there's a puddle of water right here. Why don't you get you baptized right here? And Candace's Ethiopian eunuch, okay, if you know what a eunuch is, got saved. Yeah, Dude, you know what? Can I just say this? Am I still allowed to say? I can think I can say whatever I want. There may be repercussions on the earth, but I can say whatever. The Lord will be saved. There's hope for transgender people. Yeah, that's right. No matter how far. Amen. Mm-hmm. That's right. Because they're really <coughs> straight up. Now, he was maybe castrated for a different reason. So that he wouldn't be fooling around with Candace's, the women in the court. But he was castrated nonetheless. Yeah. There's hope for transgender people. Amen. Just like there's hope for lustful pornographers, just like there's hope for alcoholics, just as there's hope for people that smoke weed, just like there's hope for people that smoke coke, just like there's hope. But you can't live in a world where you've been made drunk with the wine of her fornication through a slow, methodical process, probably starting with a kiss on the I Love Lucy. Actually, no, it had to start later than that, because Lucy and Ricky didn't even sleep in the same bed. Fast forward about 10, 15 years when the first kiss was shown on TV and everybody like was appalled by it. But now on every commercial and every sitcom, we're not just bombarded with illicit sexual relationship. We're bombarded and we're being made drunk. Yeah. Because people in the church... Don't listen to what the Bible says anymore. They listen to what the world says. And the world says everybody has a right to love somebody. But the word of God says this. And they don't read it. And so you even have Christians that are posting on Facebook. Everybody has a right to love somebody. Don't get confused between love and lust, my friend. I'm just trying to tell you a little something. That if it's outside of God's will, it ain't really God's will. That's right. That's a hard one to swallow, but it's reality. Seven heads and ten horns. So what I'm trying to tell you the seven heads are Egypt, Assyria. Those two were already out of the way when Daniel started to prophesy. Daniel prophesied during the time of Babylon, number three. He prophesied about Persia. He prophesied about Greece. He prophesied about Rome. That's six. The seventh is the ten horned kingdom. And the kingdom of Antichrist comes from the seventh because the Bible teaches us later on in chapter 17 that the ten kings give their power to the beast for, a, for an hour, which means a short period of time. They give their, they give their political power to the beast for a short period of time. All right? We've already discussed purple and scarlet and what she's wearing, okay? We've discussed the, the, the stones and the pearls. The golden cup, <coughs> the abomination of the golden cup. I mean, look, 
even, I mean, I don't mean to get into all this because this is a lot more than on YouTube, but they even used to talk about like a cup where they would do in, you know, learn, like seed thing, the seer, the seer's cup. And there's a lot of different kind of weird spiritual stuff. But look, I'm just trying to say, if you ain't never been Catholic, all you got to do is look for the Catholic mass and do If you're honest with yourself, and I know it makes people mad, but if you're honest with yourself, you see all of this stuff. And it's Catholic mass. Has anybody, anybody in here was Catholic before? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Y'all know? All right. I ain't making something up. And on her forehead was written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. All right? We've already covered all that. Let's go ahead and go to, to my little slides, and then we'll wrap this up. All right? That was not the one we were supposed to see first. The harlot and the beast. Okay? The beast, I'm just trying, this is the point that I'm trying to make. And again, some of this is my opinion, and my opinion differs from other scholars and commentators on some points. This is what I, but not every, listen to me, not every commentator and scholar understand, choose my word carefully. We all know that there's a lot of people out there that understand more about the occult than we do. I mean, at least Sabrina's looked into it. Robert and Sean have looked into it. Jessica's looked into it. I know Hannah's looked into it. I think Elena has to some, you know, to some extent. Who's that? I know she has. Any of y'all that have looked into it, y'all have probably run across people that know a lot more than Pastor Matt. But, but I do know enough to where I can work it into the my understanding of the scripture. And I get even better than that on it. After I learned it, after watching Hip Hop Five and moving down that vein. I learned that the Lord has already been talking about it in the book of Leviticus. When he said, the, the land vomits out its inhabitants. When I bring you into the land, do not do what they do. Do not drink blood. Do not boil the baby in its mother's milk. That's some kind of weird thing. Okay. Uh, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't mix the seed in the field. Why? Because they were mixing seed in Genesis. Okay. Don't do this. Don't do that. Because they were performing black magic. You would never have caught that if you went to, you went to study the other stuff. Or not don't study the other stuff. Study, understand the history of the other stuff. You, you would have never, you would have never caught any of this. But now that you see it, and now that you understand some of that and you move backwards, you see all of this stuff that we're talking about tonight is it's in the Bible, but it's been on the earth. It's played out. And many a preacher don't have a clue. I heard one preacher laugh and scoff whenever he heard that somebody said that President Bush, I'm not going to do it. I'm talking about George G, G. W. George W. You do what you want. I'm going off tonight, dude. I'm just saying whatever I feel like <laughs> saying. You can believe it got saved by Billy Graham and walked in the beach if you want to, and then you better start doing your research on Billy Graham, my friend. But anyway, another story for another time. I will tell you what I did see with my own physical eyes one time. George W. Bush on TV in an interview. So tell us about your days in the skull and bones when you were at Yale. Can you tell us about that secret society? You know, it's a secret. <laughs> okay. So you do what you want. Secret societies, Jesuitism. I didn't even get into that. It's on the papers. Jesuitism, with Ignatius Loyola, the start of Jesuitism. It's even bigger than the Vatican, my friend. He's sitting behind the scenes. His name's the Black Pope. The Catholic Pope that we have right now is the first Jesuit priest ever. Jesuitism is something good. You need to Google that later. The fourth vow of the Jesuits. What? The Black Pope. What? And listen, it's going to might create sleepless nights, and it almost, uh, most certainly, will change your current worldview. Amen. You'll come back, man. I'm here to help. Amen. <laughs> like if, you start, if you start tripping, guess what? Just call me up. I mean, if I don't answer it tonight, I'll answer it tomorrow. Amen. All right, praise God. So, what were we talking about? We were talking about the deception, and we were talking about the beast. And the, <coughs> the beast is both a system. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Wicked kingdoms. Assyria, Egypt, what were they? They were against God. They practiced mystery religions. Babylon practiced mystery religions. Persia practiced mystery religions. Okay? And, they, and you know what we learned from Daniel? We learned that there's fallen angels over them. At least over Greece and Persia. Right? How do we learn? What are you talking about? Go back and read it. Daniel tells that we're told by Angel Gabriel. To Daniel, 
Daniel, from the first day that you started to pray, your prayer was heard, and I attempted to come and give you the answer, but I was withstood by the prince of Persia, and 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 if it weren't for your for your servant Michael, the, your prince Michael, who's that? Archangel Michael, then then I would have been able to make it. And now I'm back here, and whenever I leave, we're now we're gonna go take care of the Prince of Grecia. So we're not talking about men. Oh yes, there's men that are like little chess pieces, Jesuitism. That listen, that's another thing I put in the in the paper. You can't think of Jesuits just as priests. Jesuits are all over the place. Most of the, most of the people, live, many of the people in this church know what I'm talking about. They're approached when they're at these colleges. They're approaching these colleges as candidates for future senators, for future presidents, for future CEOs, for future owners of media outlets that have now been conglomerated within about four hands. Oh, my friend, it's such a mystery and it's such a riddle and it's so difficult to see until the Lord allows us. The beast is both a system. It's a city, a place where commerce takes place, digital money. You, without such, uh, without the mark in the right hand or the forehead, no man can buy or sell. The beast is both a system and a man. The beast is seven-headed with ten crowns. Heads represent authority. Crowns represent kings and kingdoms. The harlot is every false religion and doctrine. She rides the back of the beast, the nations, and all false religion. I didn't have enough room to put it. And all false doctrine. <laughs> you know, I love it. Like, I, sometimes I like really spending time with you, Rob. I just want you to know that. I know we spend enough time. But sometimes, and he always says, I'm not a grammarian. And come to find out that's actually a word. The first time he said it, I was like, yeah, I ain't no word. No, it's a word. It's a literal word, and you use it in the right context. I'm not sure you know that. But he says, not, and he's even says sometimes I'm a simpleton. But guess what, dude? Sometimes the things that come out in a simple fashion, you can hold on to it. You can chew on it. And one of the things, and I know he probably got it from Brother Swagger, and that's okay, too. But behind every doctrine is a spirit. That's right. Yeah. Uh-oh. What are you going to say now, preacher? I'm about to tell you what I'm going to tell you. If they were preaching the truth... Or in error, whether they were preaching it on purpose or accident, the result is the same, at least a bondage instead of freedom. And now let me add another little caveat there. And it's the and, and the producer of it ain't the Holy Ghost. Right. Done. Did the preacher mean to do it? Probably not. Most of the preachers I know wouldn't purposely be spewing out false doctrine and allow themselves to be influenced by demonic spirits. But I'm trying to make a point to you. Will the Holy Spirit ever even tell a little bit of a lie? Especially if it might cause his people that are born again in the darling of heaven that he sent to hang naked on a cross and to die for our sin. Would the God of glory send his spirit to tell even a little oopsie oopsie little lie? No, he would never do such a thing. And that's why sometimes people don't like to hear the truth. Sometimes they think, man, the truth is just too much, dude. You're like getting your punch drunk. No, it's the truth. You're supposed to love it. You're supposed to drink it. You're supposed to eat it. Me and you're supposed to love it. The harlot is every false religion and every false doctrine. She rides the back of the beast. The nations and all false religion are Satan's web through which he spins his new world. All right. Seven heads. Ten horns. Let's talk about that. Nations against God. That's I already mentioned that to y'all, right? That's where we get this from. Nations against God. Biblical nations against God. The beginnings of the beast. I've already mentioned this to you. But look, Egypt is number one. Rome is number six. Oh, by the way, I put this little thing in. Bible nations against God. Again, we're not too much worried about Africa. We're not worried about too much about South America. Oh, I'm worried about South. America. I'm worried about South Americans. I'm worried about the Mexican people, but they're not biblical nations that are part. You know, they are, they're involved in it now. Their leaders have also been made drunk by the wine of fornication. They, they haven't escaped. Okay, but anyway, you get the point. The beginnings of the beast, and then there's the ten horns, again, I said, is the future nations against God. That's going to be the seventh, the ten horns of the seventh. And then we're going to move on to the completion of the beast. These, this future nation is the seventh, the ten horns is the seventh, and this is bringing, going to bring about the completion of the beast. How do I envision this ten horn kingdom in my mind? 
They say that the, Rome, the Treaty of Rome was signed originally by 10 nations, and if I'm not mistaken, it became, and you're going to have to do, Google that because some things I found said no, some things I found said no. <coughs> 10 nations originally signed the, the Treaty of Rome, supposedly, out of which, if I can't remember, sometimes I forget, it's either the EU, the European Union, or the United Nations came out of the Treaty of Rome. All right? The final move. All right, so the final move is going to be the ten horns. All right, now, I just wanted to bring you somewhere real quick, Psalm chapter 2. I wanted you to see this. Because, dude, I mean, I've been, I've been reading this to y'all. Y'all probably don't even remember. But I've been reading this psalm to the church forever. I love this psalm. I love the whole thing. But listen, it, within it, you're seeing God mentioning the nations that are against him. God's saying it. If you're not ready to see it, you won't see it. But once you know it, now I told you this, you're going to see it. Why do the heathen reign? Well, who are heathen? They're people that don't believe in God. And the people imagine a vain thing. A, a vain thing. What is that? It's empty. What, what is, why is it empty? Because you can't beat up God. You silly goose. You fool. My mom used to call me a silly goose. You're like, man. I heard you was trying to stop that car with a rope in the road. <laughs> I said, I'll check that car and I'll slip. I told her that. I was seven years old. I'll check that car and I'll slip. She's like, you silly goose. That car's going to run on you. Okay. Yeah, you silly goose. You can't hear it. What's the vain thing? You cannot defeat the God of glory. And the people imagine the vain thing. Look at this. Though. The kings of the earth set themselves. You see that? They get ready. It's just like whenever you said. You play football, you're ready, right? They set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's not about Jesus right there. This is probably written, I mean, I don't know if David wrote it. I didn't go back and look. But if this is a Davidic psalm, it's probably written in around 900 BC. All right. But if you can't tell that that's talking about Jesus, against the Lord and against his anointed. What is the word there? Messiah in the Hebrew. I can't... M-A-S-I-Y-A-H, Messiah, okay? So, Jesus, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. In other words, we don't want to live according to the rules of the Lord. We don't want to live according to the word of the Lord. We don't want, to, we don't want his commandments. We don't want his justice on the earth. We want to break his bands. We want to move away from him. We want his cords broken over us. And look what it says, he that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. I love that word. What does it mean? Unintelligibly. Mock. Stammer. It, 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 you know, they're becoming confused and they're beginning to speak unintelligibly. God's going to have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king. Talk about Jesus again. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, you art my son. This is God telling Jesus before he was ever incarnate on, in flesh on earth. You are my son. This day I have begotten you. Now, that's talking about when he would become incarnate. He's talking about the future. He's God's prophesying. Amen. Through the psalmist. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for your inheritance. Dude, this is talking about whenever we're in the book of Revelation and in the end of chapter 11, it said, The kingdoms of the earth have become the kingdoms of our God. And heaven begins to worship the Lamb, hallelujah, that is seated on the throne because he, amen, brought his justice and his judgment to the earth. Because, like I was telling you a couple of weeks back, there's going to be a day when grace is going to run out. And it's not like he wasn't long-suffering, my friend. He's been long-suffering. Amen. Amen. Amen? Ask of me, talking, talk, God talking to Jesus, and I shall give you the heathen for your inheritance in the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You know how many times that passage is used in the Bible? Multiple. Actually, there's one in Revelation 2 that he's talking about you and me ruling and reigning with him because he's talking to the church. But anyway, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel, like clay. It's just, they're just going to crumble. The nations, one day Jesus is coming back, and the sword of his mouth is going to destroy the nations at Armageddon. 
Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. No, this is my favorite part of the song. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled, but a little blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Amen? Amen. Some good stuff, huh? God's so good. All right. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. So here we go. We're starting again. I'm going to break, I'm going to break it down about to close. I promise. Look. Seven heads, these Bible nations that are against God. We've already talked about the ten horns, right? The beginnings of the beast. What were they? I've already mentioned it. This is just a little review. Egypt and Assyria. There are different colors in Babylon because Egypt and Assyria have already been moved out of the way. Whenever Daniel started to prophesy, when Daniel prophesied, he was in Babylon. You remember that? They went and took him off the playground at school. I'm making that up, but that's the point. He was a young man, a teenager, and he's playing in the streets of maybe Jerusalem one day, and all of a sudden Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, comes and takes him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and brings them back to Babylon. So when he begins to prophesy, he's already in Babylon, and he prophesies about Persia, and it came to pass. And he prophesies about Greece, and it came to pass. And then he prophesies about another one that was different than all the others, Rome. And one of the things that made Rome different was because we learned this out of Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 through 27. We don't have to go, we don't have time to go there. Let me tell you what we know. It says that the people, the people of the prince that is to come, the prince that is to come is talking about the Antichrist. The people of the prince that is to come will destroy the city and the temple. What people did that? I know y'all know. Come on, say it. Shout it out there. What people did it? Rome. Rome did it in AD 70. The people of the prince. So what does that tell us? Rome did it in AD 70. The prince doesn't come to the end. So that means that the prince has to come from some part of the Roman or some type of a revitalized Roman Empire. Listen, this is confusing. It's a lot of information. But I want to make a point to you. Rome may never die, my friend. Vatican City, Seven Hills, dressed in scarlet and purple, Jesuitism, the black pope, the influence in the creation of this city-state known as Mystery of Babylon, the great city, this city is in existence today. You and I are living in it, but we ought not be of it. Do you understand? Oh, I, bought, I bought me some NVIDIA stock. I bought it, and I hope it comes back. But guess what? There's coming a day when ain't, NVIDIA ain't going to be able to help you. Apple computer ain't going to be able to help you. There's coming a day when we turn the page from chapter 17 to chapter 18 that financial Babylon is going to be done. I don't know what might happen next week. And then they say, well, you were a fool. You put your money in NVIDIA. Guess what? We all will be in the same boat on that day, my friend. You think that paper cash is going to help you? Sometimes I wonder, will gold really help? And some people say yes, but this is what I'm saying. You remember that song, DC Talk redid it? It was that old song about the rapture of the church. I wish we'd all been ready. A bag of gold came by a loaf of bread, my friend. <laughs> That's what you want to really need. I want to talk this stuff through, man. I'm going to work with an algorithm, okay? I need to sell all the stuff. I need to buy me a farm somewhere up in the hills of Tennessee. But then, you know, I need to build plant some shrubs around my property so they can't see me from the road. And then here he comes. <laughs> Flying over in his helicopter. Look at all that corn down there. Let's go get that Christian that's trying to hide off the bridge. Man, look, dude. Yeah. And then what you, I'm not trying to be weird, but I am weird. Like, then what you going to do? Okay, but I got to I'm going to tell you right now. I don't care if you know whoever you are. I got some food stored at the house. I got some water. Y'all don't come try to steal my stuff, man. I give y'all a little nibble if y'all get hungry. Y'all don't come try to take my stuff. I got some food. I got some water. I even got a rain catcher out there. Okay? But let me tell you a little secret. What you, you know, how, what are you going to poop? You know, oh, you're going to do like the old day. You're going to dig a hole. Yeah, okay. You think they're going to let you get away with that in the city? Anyway, you get my point, dude. No matter which angle you go down, I'm trying to talk about if you hear for when the bad stuff goes down. I know that people watching it. <laughs> It's not just this, it's not a conspiracy theory, my friend. It's a conspiracy. And the reason I know it is because it's in the Bible. Amen. People might say, Oh, you grown, you grown mad, Paul, from all your learning. You grown mad back from all this learning. No, it's not mad. It's ready to be prepared. I mean, have understanding. The Lord is teaching. 
All right, here's these, these 10 kingdoms, all right? But see, that was the interesting thing. Out of Rome will come a revitalized Roman Empire. Well, really, Rome isn't dead. I made that point, right? Rome's still alive. And out of it, and Rome is moving and shaking behind the scenes. Again, how many times do I have to say it? Through Jesuitism, through the Vatican, through the money that's filtered in, through all that. Dude, if you could really start, you need to start researching some of this. And then get back with me next year, and we'll talk about how good it costs. You know what I'm saying? Because it's going to take a while. Or no, you don't have to. You just, but if, that, if that's the case, you're going to have to trust me a little bit. The Ten Horn Kingdom, which is the future kingdom, will come. And guess what? It's going to be the Sabbath, right? And the Ten Horns have ten crowns. And crowns represent kingdoms. It says it in the, in the chapter. When we get to it and we read it, it's going to tell us that the, that the crowns represent kingdoms. And guess what? The final move, the ten kingdoms give their power to the Antichrist for a short period of time. See, this is when it's all coming to an end. This has been the plan all along. Through the Tower of Babel, through the Genesis 6 episode that took place with the daughter, sons of God, with the daughters of men, introducing Nephilim upon the land, and then the disembodied Nephilim becoming demon spirits and causing confusion in the lives of people for all of these years, and then demon spirits uh, in giving wisdom and Satan giving wisdom to people like the Rothschild family and the, Kent, and the Kennedys and the Rockefellers and the Federal Reserve Bank and don't even belong to the U.S. and our whole economy is hinging on this. Will he rise? The, will he raise the inflate the, the the interest rate to help inflation? Dude, it's like my dad said a long time ago. My dad was not. I can't really say say what he said because they call me a racist. Not that there's not there's enough people watching that they can call me a racist if he said. But you know, well, let me just say it like this politically correct. You know how in in Arabian countries they wear cloth on their head to prevent the sun. So my dad would say like on this little racial term about the people over there. I'm like, well, daddy, why does the price of oil go up? Cause them blankety blank, they tighten up that valve a little bit. And I, I was just a kid, and so I would imagine some man over there literally tightening the valve. But guess what? It's kind of like that. Somebody makes a decision that the price of oil is going to go up because it ain't like they ain't got enough oil. Come on. Right. You, United States of America got enough oil. Russia definitely got oil. Yeah, I know they're using that as an excuse for why it's happening over there. But all those Middle Eastern countries, there is enough oil to go around. No, it's a, it's a plan. It's a ploy. Okay? And, and, and it's the same thing with other things. And I can keep going on and on, but I'm just trying to tell you that it's all a plan. It's coming to fruition. Will we be here? I don't know. But will you be ready? We should be. To face whatever we have to face. And in the meantime, what do we do? We keep our heart right with the Lord. Amen. We pray. We let God do a work in us so that he, he can do a work through us. Amen. Amen. We tell other people about Jesus. And when the opportunity arises, you never act like me in public. And start trying to tell them all this stuff and then sit Never do that. You could have ever heard of Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. Yes. We see that there is deception upon the earth, oh Lord God, but we do know the simple verse yes. that says that he that is in us yes. is greater yes. than he that is in the world. We yes. believe that, Lord Jesus. We believe that. We know you are Messiah. Amen. We desire to kiss the king. We desire to have a relationship with God through your sacrifice, Lord. We desire to die daily. We desire to be led by your spirit, Lord God. Protect your people, Lord. Give your church, Lord. Those that are truly yours. Those that belong to yours, Lord. Those, you know, there's so many people that are caught up in false doctrine, but they love you, Lord. They love you. I pray that you would begin to give wisdom and understanding to the world, that people would be able to see What's going on, Lord God? We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.